I'm all set. All right, well, good evening. We're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2, so if you would, please open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. And I'll pray while you're doing that. Father, thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being so personal with us, Lord. And uh, Lord, we pray tonight that you would speak to us by your spirit. That we would learn more about surrendering our will to yours, Lord. And that you'd have your way here tonight. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, the book of 1 John, uh, for me, is a a book that challenges me often in the way I live my life. And uh, it's a book about what you say, what you do. You say this and you do that. And it challenges you. And we'll see that as we go through this. But uh, this book speaks as though your father is talking to his children. And First John is a family-type epistle. It emphasizes the relationship of the family of God. And I mention this because there is so much emphasis in uh, you know, the church today on the body of truth, and that all believers are a part of the body, which is true. But it's more taught in the book of Ephesians, and it's a wonderful book as well. But this book makes it more of a family thing. We're the family of God, um, and He's our Father. And we need to have fellowship with our Heavenly Father, and it is our Father who instructs His children with the issues of life. So verse 1, the first part of verse 1, He starts out and says, My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And it starts out with my little children, and it's kind of referencing uh, new believers, young believers, uh, born-again believers here. And uh, it's an endearing term. And it's how we might refer to our own children when they're little. My little, my little Noah, <laughs> wherever he is right now. But... Uh, John speaks about the purpose of his writing is to bring uh, you and I into a fellowship with God. Uh, but there are things that do break the fellowship that we have with God, and it's sin. And Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, you can write that down and check it out later, but uh, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. God's always there. He's able to save if we reach out to him and ask him for it. But he speaks right after this of the one thing that does separate us is, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Um, kind of interesting. You know, as a believer, you read that, and, it, and this makes you kind of check yourself out. Um, if you're sinning and you claim to be a Christian, you have separated yourself from God. And uh, there's always consequences of sin. And God said to Adam, for in the day that you eat of it, or sin, you shall surely die. And Adam sinned, and God came into the garden, and he said, Adam, where are you? Seems like I heard that in Congress recently. But anyways, pay no attention to that. I don't know why I said that. But fellowship with God had been broken as a result of sin, as, as it always is. And so in order that you might have fellowship with God, it is necessary that you don't sin. And John is writing this, you know, however, that you might have power over sin. And the power over sin, of course, comes through the abiding and enduring and steadfastness of the Holy Spirit within our lives. He says, I write this to you that you may not sin. And so the second half, verse 1, he says, And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's, that's good news. We have an advocate. And, uh, you know, he is, Jesus our supporter. He's our supporter. Uh, and he intercedes. And interceding means he reconciles us to God on our behalf. And so he is our defense. Jesus is our defense. And if we sin... We have Jesus as our advocate before the Father, and he is the only righteous one. 
Now, there's some verses here that are really encouraging as far as uh, that type of intercession we have with God through Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That means to reconcile us to God. He's there for us through prayer. And then Romans 8, 34, Who is he who condemns? That's a good question. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. You know, he's the one that's there for us. He died on our behalf and he rose from the, the grave because we know that the penalty for sin is death. Who is even at the right hand of God? who also makes intercession for us. He's making intercession for us. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So he is our mediator. He's there for us. He's the man that stepped into the gap for us, if you will. So when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The one representing us is Jesus Christ the righteous. And we remember that in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, you know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So important. I think it's important that we come to a reckoning with our own sin and ask God to forgive us through Christ. And it's good to know that we have someone to turn to to cleanse us from unrighteousness. And our God has provided a way for us because He loves us. You have to remember that He loves us so much. There's, there's a story of a, a preacher who was trying to get the point across to his congregation that there isn't anybody here that's perfect. You know, he might have said, you know, well, Mary Proppins is practically perfect, but that's as far as she goes, you know. But he said, is there anybody here who has ever seen a perfect man? And he challenged everybody, and nobody was saying anything. You know, he said again, is there anybody here who has seen a, a perfect man? Well, this little guy in the back kind of squeamishly raises his hand, and, and so the preacher points at him and goes, have you seen a perfect man? And he said, well, I've never seen him, but I've heard about him. Well, who is he? The preacher exclaimed. He's my wife's first husband. <laughs> I guess the guy heard about him quite a bit. But the matter of the fact is, none of us are perfect. Nobody is. And if we're honest with ourselves, we too will have to say that God hasn't made us perfect yet. And this is why John writes that you may not sin. Our Lord doesn't want us to live in sin. And 1 John 5.18 says, we know that Whoever is born of God does not sin. And this means whoever is born of God does not practice sin. You're not continually in it. You're going to sin. We're sinners. We're saved by grace and it's not by our, our deeds. We know that. And, you know, we don't continue to live in sin. But we remember if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so... 1 John verse uh, 2 in chapter 2, it says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. We have to remember that God sent his Son for the whole world. None of us are righteous. For the whole world. And here, propitiation means atonement. He's our compensation. He paid the price for our sins. And it means that sins have been all paid for by the suffering of another. Christ is my advocate interceding for me, and he himself is the propitiation. And I love the fact that John points out that this atonement wasn't just our sins. And I'm repeating it. It's for everybody's sins. And, you know, sometimes I think when we get older, we can come, become crusty and say, oh my gosh, that person calls himself a Christian. But, you know, we call ourselves Christians and we sin too. And we forget where we came from sometimes. But because of the faithful advocacy of Christ, the Holy Spirit brings conviction to us. And, you know, if he brings it to us, he can bring it to others. We just pray. And, 
And it gets us focused on God. And if we confess our sin to the Father, you know, we can be cleansed. You know, to confess means that we're actually getting on God's side when we confess our sin. We're admitting our condition. We realize that we have a condition that we fall short. And we get to be on His side when we confess. And we see the sin from His perspective. And it takes on a whole new look because when you compare yourself to nobody else but Him, you're a filthy, rotten, stinking sinner. All of us are. And you know, the genuine child of God wants to please the Father and He walks along with Him and with that in mind. You know, and the psalmist pretty much expressed it in Psalm 139. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. I mean, when you read through the Psalms, you know, the guy is just pouring his heart out. He's being completely honest. He's not somebody on a, you know, on an ivory tower or anything. He recognizes it. Search me, Lord. You know, and, and I think sometimes when we pray a prayer like that, our sin gets revealed to us because I think he may not even have known all of his sins. I don't think any of us know all of our sins, but we do know that we fall short. But here he's asking him to lead him in the way of everlasting. And if you're a child of God, you are in the family of God. And he wants to have fellowship with you. And you might think that in some way you're going to be able to live a Christian life by following the rules. (laughs) Good luck with that. Uh, God doesn't want you to be a, a programmed robot or a computer of sorts. He's not trying to do that to you. You're a human being, and he wants you to have a free will to choose to love him, to choose to follow him. And you have your own free will, but you're a member of his family, and he wants to have fellowship with you. And we can talk to him, and I love this, like I can talk to him like nobody else. And uh, oftentimes when I'm in my car by myself, I talk to him like I talk to nobody else. <laughs> and it's good to know that I can do that. And it's good to know that he hears me. And I'm glad that he's gracious because some of the things I say sometimes to him aren't always good things. Sometimes I'm just sharing my frustration and, you know, my hurts and angers and anxieties and stuff. And it's not always good. But then he just kind of brings me around. He doesn't even say anything real loud, just real quiet in my heart. I hear him speak to my heart. And I kind of come back around. In John 14, 21, Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You know, Paul basically said in Romans chapter 2 that, you know, you think you're going to keep the law? He goes, don't think you're justified by doing that. Well, I've heard people in the past who really didn't know what they were saying. You know, I, I live up to the Ten Commandments. Well, nobody does. It just shows us that we're short uh, of the glory of God. But hearers of the law are not just in the sight of God, but doers of the law will be justified. How's that work? You know, we can't fulfill the law. Jesus also said in John 13, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And uh, so you begin to hear what the motivation is here. What is the important thing in living with God and living for God and trying to please Him? It's love. Bottom line, he's the author of love. Love one another. Love him and love others. And so in verse 4, he says, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John just kind of says it like it is. You know, you say this, but this is what you do, or don't do. And you've heard it said, you know, what you're doing is speaking so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying. And that's the way it is as Christians as we live our lives as a testimony to the Lord and to others. And when we become Christians, you want to please the Father. And 
your lifestyle changes. It begins to slowly change. God changes you from the inside out. And true belief in Jesus Christ is going to be manifested in our behavior. I cannot walk in darkness and possess light. Verse 5 says, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we are in him. So, the love of God, again, is perfected in us if we're keeping his word. Paul said in Romans 13, he says, Owe nothing to anybody except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. There it is again. The whole object of being a Christian is demonstrating love. So loving one another is the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. And this kind of love puts the other first. Therefore, you will not steal your neighbor's things. You will not covet his wife. You will not commit adultery. And you're not going to lie. Why? Because you're loving God and you're loving others first. And if you love them, you're not going to do anything to hurt them. You're living a life that pleases God and your love for him puts others above yourself. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? Love. And I think it's demonstrated in joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. If you're doing those things, there's nothing that can condemn you. Nothing. And it all comes down to loving God. Loving God first and foremost, and loving one another. And that's where it's at. You, you, you do that, and you've done them all. You've kept them all. And that's the inclination of your heart. And God reads your heart. He, he knows where you're at. He that loves God loves his brother also. He who says he abides, in verse 6, in him ought himself also ought to walk just as he walked. Got to walk like Jesus if you're abiding in him. At least you're inclined in that direction. You know, you'll hear Pastor Mike and me say, you know, if you're going to fall, fall forward. Don't fall backwards. I mean, oftentimes when we do fall, you know, we get discouraged because the enemy's telling you, see, you're no good. You can't do it. No, you can't live up to the law. But I live for a gracious heavenly father who sent his son to pay the price for my sins. And he, he went up and he died on that cross for me. And so I fall forward and I get back up. A righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up, the Bible declares. Jesus is our example. And, and we need to just look at his life and really examine it for ourselves and see what it is that motivated him. It was love. He didn't come as a judge. Not, not this time he didn't. In Matthew chapter 11 it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that. You know, carrying the law around is heavy. It's just too heavy to carry. And he says, you know, if you're laboring, come to me. I'll give you rest. If you're heavy laden, come to me. I'll give you a break. You don't need to be carrying that junk with you. My yoke is light. He says, learn from me. He wants us to look at him and examine him. I'm gentle. That's good to know that your God is gentle. He loves you. And you'll find rest for your souls. That's not heavy. He don't want to put no weight on you. And if I'm abiding, staying in him, then I'll be walking as he did and living like him. And my concern is going to be for others. And many times we read in the New Testament that Jesus was moved with compassion for others. You know, just having compassion for others. He was often touched in his heart to, treat, to reach out and to help those who had need. And we know a lot about seeing that in the Bible from Jesus' acts of healing and touching the, the blind and healing them and the lame. 
In verses 7 through 11, he says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've heard from the beginning, have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So we see what causes darkness in our own lights. I mean, in our own life is, is just by the way we live our life. If we hate our brother, the light is not in us. And so what is darkness? It's hatred. What is walking in darkness? It's hating. Now, if, you, if there's someone you're really upset with and you really hate them, you're walking in darkness. But, but I can't stand them, you might say. I hate them. And sometimes that's a difficult hurdle to get over. I think we've all experienced that. But the point is, is that John's telling us, you know, as Christians, you're walking in darkness. You might say you're in the light, but maybe we're deceiving ourselves when we say that. You're blind, you're stumbling along, and you can't see where you're going. The darkness has blinded us, blinded your eyes, and there's nothing so blinding as hatred and Hatred can really make you lose your perspective on things. And when your heart is filled with bitterness and hatred towards somebody, uh, you, you become blind to any good or anything of any value that might exist. You don't want to see that. And you can't see the good. And love is light. It lights the way. Have you ever noticed a couple who's in love? They just seem kind of lit up, don't they? Basically, is the whole teaching of Christ and the gospel is all summed up in the concept of love and loving God and loving each other. And I, I, I think that once we get that concept, it helps us. I mean, it's a growing process because we all stumble. We all do stupid things. But if we turn towards him and just look to him. You know, I try, to, I try to take it to the cross and just remember what he did there was for everybody, not just me. It doesn't make me special over anybody else. I write to you, little children, verse 12, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Just a reminder. Your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Think about it. He died on the cross. Not only died, but he rose from the grave. And John explains why he's writing this. But these things apply to all Christians who may forget along the way. And I think we all do. We forget from time to time. And the basis on which all Christians rest is the forgiveness of sins because of the shed blood of Christ. Your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. For his name's sake. And it's unfortunate that some Christians stay in the position of little children and never seem to mature from that area and move forward. So now we're going to see how John addresses that. He kind of shifts from little children to fathers in this next verse. In verse 13, he says, I write to you fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. And so I think as he writes to the fathers, he's referencing those who have known the Lord for some time. And then he writes to the young men. You know, these guys are, 
uh, the ones that are becoming strong in faith and have become stronger in the Lord as they have grown. They're kind of like midway in their walk with the Lord. And then again, referring to little children who have come to know the Father, but you know they're young and they, they've recently received Jesus as their Savior, and yet they're they're not well versed and and they're growing, and they they don't know too much just yet, and so. There's different levels of spiritual development. I think sometimes we forget that. You know, not everybody's at the same place that we are in our lives with our walk with the Lord. And so in verse 14, he says, I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Now, it almost sounds like the same as verse 14, except he changes it up with the young men. He says about them that they have overcome the wicked one. And he says how, the, how and why uh, prior to that. It's, it's because the word of God abides in them. And the word of God is always the strength against the attacks of the enemy. We need the word of God. And it doesn't matter how far you, uh, your progress in the spiritual experience and your relationship with God is, you will, will as long as you're in this body, uh, not be immune to the attacks of the enemy. Sorry. <laughs> and it seems like even, you know, as you grow in the Lord, they seem to get bigger. Uh, you never grow beyond temptation, and uh, you'll seem to get more and bigger ones along the way as you uh, grow in the Lord. You never grow beyond the point of struggling with the enemy. Uh, you know, just being in constant conflict with the uh, enemy. But this is what David says in Psalm 119. He says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. His word, so powerful. God's word is powerful. It's the power of his word that gives us strength and keeps us from sinning against him. Ultimately, when we sin, that's who we sin against, is God. We sin against each other many times. But the bottom line is, is we're sinning against him. And I think that kind of helps you bring it into perspective. Now John's going to give us a course of action here for all of this. He says, Do not love the world, in verse 15, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So let's check this out and see what he's talking about. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon, money. You can be, you know, this can be really a tough balance when you think about it. Even the Lord said, you know, a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. You've got to work. But I think the balance comes in when you realize you've got to work to keep a roof over your head and eat and take care of your family, but you cannot make money your master. That's real easy to do. I had lots of opportunities to do that when I worked on the railroad. And there was a small season in which I kind of pursued it for a little while, but lots of money, but never saw the family. And, you know, this has to do with laying up treasures, you know. If, if money is where your heart is, that is the thing that has mastered your life. And if you're mastered by your possessions, you cannot be a servant of God also. You cannot serve God and mammon. And you cannot be mastered by two masters. You'll get torn apart. And you'll begin to neglect, neglect the one along the line. And you'll hold to the one and hate the other. And it's just a terrible mess. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's been tried many times. And it doesn't work. And so... John shares here what he means by the world in verse 16. For all that is in the world, 
listen carefully, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. You know, Satan loves to tempt us with these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's been the same M.O. since the Garden of Eden. Same thing, same exact thing. If you want to turn to Genesis chapter 3, we'll look at it real quick. Verses 1 through 6. And we remember Satan said to the woman, has God indeed said? I mean, when he does that, when, when you hear that challenge, did he really say that? Come on, you know. No, he didn't really say that, did he? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So he twists the word. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees uh, of the garden. But if the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. She kind of got a little confused there too. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And then what? You'll be like God. Mmm, some pride there knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the lust of the eyes, that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life, there they are, those three, she took it and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Today, his attacks are the same way, the exact same way. And, you know, today, you know, we carry our phones around with us. We got the internet right there, computers, TVs. We're influenced by all these outside things. I was at my doctor's appointment today, and I was just sitting there looking around the room, and everybody had a phone looking at it. And I don't know what they were looking at, but it's interesting how we are so influenced by those things. But I think a lot of things that come up on the screen there are, are designed to inflame our passions and to start our mind thinking in these ways, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, working together here, and creating desires of fleshly fulfillment that is outside of confines of God and His things He's established. And, you know, we're told that if any man loves the world, the world system, the things that are going on, the love of the Father is not in him, and we cannot love these things and God at the same time. You've got to choose. Matthew 6, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So, you know, we have to examine our own hearts on that. And be honest with yourself. Now, John gives us a reason to what he just said in verse 17. He says, the world is passing away. All right? Right there we're told, guess what? The stuff you're liking, it has no eternal value whatsoever. It's all going to burn, baby. The world's passing away. The lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now that's speaking of eternal life. Basically what he's saying is... If your life is bound up in worldly things, the lust and the desires and the love of the world, if that's where your life is, know that it's just going to die. It's going to pass away. And you're, you know, you're investing in things that are going to perish. You've got to have a perspective. And our real problem is that we so often lose sight of eternity. I know we all do that. We forget for a second, huh? Just for a second. And as we're in this world, we get so involved in worldly things that our vision becomes clouded and we lose the sense and the consciousness of eternal life. And when you lose the consciousness of the eternal, then Satan can mess with your head all he wants. And we end up believing his lies. It only takes a second. Now, I love this part here because he now gives us the urgency 
of his message here. In verse 18, he says, Little children, it is the last hour. And, you know, you read this and you go, Well, man, that was, you know, thousands of years ago. And uh, he says, As you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Well, he says not... He says that the Antichrist, the real Antichrist, the main guy, is coming. But there's been a lot along the way. And in the last times, there's going to be many false Christs that will arise. And, you know, you've all read and heard the stories of people proclaiming to be God or Christ. And uh, they're all declaring themselves to be the Savior of the world. Now, that happened in John's day just like it does in our day. And John took that as a sign that they were in the last times. And, you know, as I've shared before, I believe Jesus is coming real soon. And I think you, you need that perspective to help you realize the urgency of the hour. Um, he is coming soon for his church. And I think this passage gives us perspective that the Lord is coming soon. And what difference does that make? Uh, that the Lord is coming. I believe knowing that the Lord is coming soon is what spurs us on to live for Him and to reach out to others. You don't know the day or the hour, he says. You don't know the day or the hour of His return. But the other part of that is that you don't know when your life's going to be required. Now there's good news in both points of that. Uh, as far as him coming or dying. It's a win-win situation if you love God. He's coming for us sooner than we realize or think. And John, John is going to now uh, share his concern about those who've left the fold, but I just see that dying is just the same as if he raptured us. And we'll see that a little bit later because it's not like you cease to exist when you die. You're just moving out of this, this tent that's got pegs popping out and sticks cracking and everything else in it. But he goes on here and he says, they went out from us, in verse 19, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So the Word of God will do His work in everyone, including those who don't believe. And sometimes God just cleans house. And He says, But you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. It seems that when the Holy Spirit is indwelling you, there is a certain intuitive knowledge from the Holy Spirit that comes to us. When you're in the Word and you keep reading it, you keep filling your mind with it, filling your heart, you begin to see things a little differently, a little more discernment. And it's an interesting thing that, you know, almost a different thing when you have this um, kind of intuitiveness, that's the only way I can explain it, and you're dealing with a person that doesn't. It's, it's like you can see something so clearly a certain way, and they can't see it. And you go, why can't you see that? Why don't you understand what's going on here? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit reveals those things. Not everybody's going to understand. I remember in my younger years I'd witnessed the people and it just seemed like I was talking to a wall. They didn't understand what I was talking about. God's Spirit has got to reveal it to them. Verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, 
and that no lie is from the truth or is of the truth. We know the truth. And how do we know the truth? Because the Spirit of God has planted the truth in us. As we read the Word, we're filling our lives with us. You know, Jesus is the Word, right? I mean, the three are one. God, Son, Holy Spirit. And as we're taking in his word, we're bringing it into our head. As a man thinks, so is he, the Bible declares. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that he died for our sins and rose again on the third day. And so verse 22 says, Who is a liar but the one who denies Jesus Christ? He's the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So how do we know the truth? It's the Spirit of God. He's born witness in our hearts of His truth. And a lot of people don't know this, but uh, they believe a lie. And it's those who deny Jesus as the Messiah. And if Jesus wasn't the Son of God, then He's a liar. And how can you say that a liar is a good man? You know, you say, well, He wasn't God, He was just a real good guy. He's just a prophet, you know. He was a good guy. How can, you, how can a liar be a good guy? You don't equate those things in our head. Um, he must be a fraud or a deceiver. And how can you say that he was a good man? It doesn't make sense. He was either God manifested in the flesh or he was a deceiver and a liar and a fraud. So he wasn't a good man if he was those things probably the worst liar in the world if you believe that whoever denies the son does not have the father either he who acknowledges the son has the father also it's those two things right there and a lot of people don't accept Christ as the Messiah and you cannot disconnect the son from the father Jesus bore witness himself that he and the father were one he said I and the Father are one. Kind of hard to get around that one. You can't pull them apart. And in verse 24, he says, Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So, in the beginning of their faith, they were taught that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And he came to be the Savior of the world. Now, I think we need to cling to that. Abide in it. And and continue in in that thought that the Son is in the Father and the Father is in the Son and they are one. And I love this here, verse 25. And this is the promise that he has promised to us eternal life what an awesome promise i am so glad to hear that i'm so glad to read that he's promised us eternal life what kind of perspective does that give you and we know john 3:16 for god so what he loved us he loved the world Uh, He didn't just love good people. He loved the creepiest people. The ugliest people. The most terrible people. The meanest people. He loved everybody. He loved us sinners. He gave His only begotten Son that who's simple. Whosoever believes. Do you believe in Him? Do you believe He is the Son of God? Do you believe He died on the cross and rose again from the grave? I love that. Well, you guess what? You don't have to perish, but you get everlasting life for believing. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. That's good news. We believe in Him. And real clear cut, he who does not believe does not. They shall not see life. And it says, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 
John 11, verses 25 through 26. This is one of my favorite verses. It sounds so contradictory, but it is so sewed together here. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's what I was talking about earlier. Guess what? Your body dies, but you keep on living. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And here's the other part. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Could be talking about the rapture there. You're alive at his coming. It's a win-win situation. Don't be afraid of death. It can work either way. If you're his, you're his. He's not going to leave you out on the porch, you know, freezing out there. Psalm 23 talks about death. Though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, guess what? He knows he is with him. God meets us right there at that door. He meets us there. And the question at the end of that is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Verse 26 and 27. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Well, there's lots of deceivers out today. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it, it has taught you, you will abide in him. Again, we remember 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual understands all things. You need God's Holy Spirit so you understand. Now, what John is not saying is that we don't need a teacher or men to be teaching the Word of God. Because Paul said, you know, he's put pastors and teachers and elders and deacons in the church. He pointed them there. But though I may be called as a pastor or teacher and may be teaching the Word of God, you can't really learn the Word of God except from the Holy Spirit. There's people that will come and hear the Word of God and walk in and walk out and not understand a word. You need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness to your heart of the truth and it plants the truth in your heart. So the teaching really comes from the Holy Spirit that which really sticks in your heart and abides in your heart. And so he says in verse 20, And now, little children, abide in him. Then when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So he's challenged us all the way through this chapter to live for him, live like him. You know, if you're abiding in Christ, you'll be walking as he walked. And then I ask myself, what am I going to be doing when he shows up unannounced? I think that's a good question. What am I going to be doing when he shows up for his church unannounced? No man knows the day or the hour, or the minute or the second. Now, we need to live in the awareness that the Lord can come at any time. And you don't want to be ashamed at his coming. You're doing something stupid that you shouldn't be doing that maybe you've been stuck practicing in or something for a while and boom, he shows up. The Bible tells us to redeem the time, to take up the opportunities, to take advantage of the time that gives, God gives us which we might have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so he says in verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices, there's that word again, practices righteousness, is born of him. You make it a point to live that way. Are you perfect? No. 
None of us are perfect. The main commandment that we need to hold up is to love God and love each other, putting others above ourselves. And so it, it kind of leaves us the question, do you know that he is righteous? And how do you know that he is righteous? And, and, and we know that he's righteous by what? His Holy Spirit shows us that in us. And how do I know those who practice righteousness? Because I can see them and by experience. And I know those that do uh, righteousness are born of him. And just remember, he's coming really, really soon. Uh, we were sitting at lunch today talking about some of the things that are going on in the Middle East. And, you know, that's the time clock right there. Israel's a time clock. It, it, there ain't much left to happen. It's happening real soon. I, I did a devotion with my family at Thanksgiving and handed them those coins, and they were blown away when they saw that. They didn't know some, that existed. The coins, the temple coins that have a picture of Cyrus and Trump on it. And just all that stuff. I mean, there's things rolling right now to get that temple going up real soon. And if that's the case, we're there. Anytime. Anytime. It's coming real soon. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, Lord, and showing us how we can know where we're at with you, Lord. Help us not to say one thing and do another, Lord, but help us to live a life that's pleasing to you. And Lord, thank you for your grace that you give us in, in times where we, we fall. But help us not to believe the lies of the enemy that we might just cave in and throw in the towel, but rather, Lord, that we'd get back up and know that you're the lifter of our head. God, we thank you and we love you and we appreciate so much how you bless us, God, and love us and given us your word that not only comes to mind, but it, it resides in our heart. So, Lord, this evening we just say take over. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand for the last song.